When I was a kid, I was definitely uh, one of the odder children. I had concerns that, that, that other children shouldn't have to be burdened with. I had a fascination with uh, old television shows, and I was always older than I should have been. When I was younger, I used to take a little tape recorder out on the front porch and with uh, some of the neighbor kids and my buddy Scott, we would do radio plays, which were uniformly awful. Um, and no one ever heard them. We never bothered to play them back. Just the act of recording them seemed to be enough. And uh, it was probably my, my first exposure to writing. When I was in about the fourth grade, I checked out a book called The Toothpaste Millionaire. And I read the book about 40 times. <laughs> and I thought I could be a writer, I could be an artist. I want to write books. I actually ended up falling over into the comic book arena around the time I turned 10 or 11. And I got fascinated with the people who wrote and illustrated comic books. I would tell you that the defining moment for me when I realized the power of the visual married to the narrative is uh, the work that Will Eisner did on the old Spirit comics was very cinematic. And I started getting that idea of, you know, writing with an eye for, you know, with word balloon placement, where are people going to be in your frame? And comic books, just like TV, end up being a matter of, you know, where you're choosing to frame your action and how to highlight it. So television seemed like a natural extension of that. There are shows like when I worked on Dancing with the Stars, there's quite a thrill about being able to work with certain celebrities that you've enjoyed since you were younger. Uh, every week, trying to come up with some place to send George Hamilton, you know, was a real treat for me because I always I loved the guy since I was a kid. And every week he'd give me flack about where I sent him, and every week when it was over, he'd tell me he had the time of his life. That's the glamour associated with reality television. When we were nominated for an Emmy for Split Ends in 2009, it is the first time that my name has ever appeared on an Emmy nomination. And I can remember when I joined the Academy in 2002, going to my first Emmy Awards and sitting in a room with 10,000 people at the Shrine Auditorium and looking around and thinking every person in that room took the risk to do this for a living. And I thought, how cool is it just to be a member of this thing? And to get nominated for an Emmy seven years later. I mean, you can't, you can't imagine how great that feels. I find no shame in being close to my parents. I'm lucky enough that I have the kind of support system that you absolutely cannot move forward without. Uh, my folks were behind me when I wanted to go to art school. My folks were behind me when I wanted to go to film school. If I could think of another thing that is generally less useful, I'm sure they would stand behind me and I could get my degree in Elizabethan poetry. They are behind me 100% no matter what I do, and that's really, you know, I kid around about it, but it's if I didn't have that, that behind me, I would not be anywhere near where I am now. We always tried to give Troy enough rope to do the things that he felt a real passion for. Um, sometimes it was really hard, especially the stuntman episode, because the porch was fairly high <laughs> and away from the ground. But um, you have to look at each individual and figure out that they're, we're not all alike. People are going to have dreams, and they just have to go for them. I will tell you unabashedly that I was a huge misfit as a child. Just uh, nothing about me was similar to anything my peers were interested in. I was a freaking weird kid. And the best part is all that weird stuff now just makes me funnier and makes the shows better. So it all comes full circle. Embrace, embrace being weird. <laughs>